Here we go! My friends, today we have roughly 20 minutes of obscure, rare, and unusual facts about GoldenEye 007. Things that I'd imagine the vast majority of viewers probably don't know, nor have ever considered. Some are obscure glitches, some are the results of rare GameShark codes, and some are just the wonderful minutia that makes reflecting on this era of video gaming so comfy and nostalgic. For example, did you know there's a way to crash the game by using the plastiques on Silo? Or have you ever seen this rare line of dialogue from Boris? Well, that's just the start of it, so buckle on in, because you're about to learn a whole bunch of useless facts and knowledge about the one and only GoldenEye 007. But first, my friends, it's time to enjoy some Raid Shadow Legends, the truly remarkable game that you or anyone else could be playing right now on your phone or your PC while watching this video. I've been grinding some more raid while editing and having a great time, finally getting strong enough to defeat the potion keep bosses on max difficulty, and it feels pretty damn good. Recently, they've added a brand new faction called the Sylvan Watchers, consisting of champions of elves, tree creatures, and other various woodland spirits and entities. They're in the Nyrison Union, and it's always exciting to see more champions added. I only have a couple of them so far, but they're pretty good. I'm still leveling up my Mycelliac Priest Orn, and I'm hoping to get Green Warden Ruark with my next legendary pull, so fingers crossed. Now, if you start playing today, there's still time to get in on the 12 Days of Raid Christmas promotion. Just download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your player ID from in-game, and then go to 12daysofraid.plarium.com, link in description, enter your player ID, and then set out on a fun and festive adventure that lasts 12 days, running from December 19 to January 10. Each day, experience a new chapter of this wintry story and play a new minigame for a chance to win some amazing in-game and real-life prizes, including holiday-themed raid champions and even Amazon gift cards worth up to $1,000. And if you're an existing raid player, you can still go to 12daysofraid.plarium.com where you can find a special holiday promo code that everyone can use for a small festive gift. Raid's got something extra special happening now. They've released a legendary champion based off MMA and pro wrestling legend Ronda Rousey. Yes, THE Ronda Rousey. You can get her for free right now, whether you're a new or longtime player, just by logging into Raid. All you've got to do is log in and play for seven days in between now and February 20th, and Ronda is yours. That's all there is to it. There's also a special promo code to celebrate this, Raid Ronda, available for all users new and old to get a bunch of helpful stuff. Just enter promo code Raid Ronda in game and all these goodies are yours. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click the link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you will get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Chonoru, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 epic skill tome. All this treasure will be waiting for you here, available for 30 days for new players only. So, there you have it, all the new stuff happening in Raid Shadow Legends. Check it out today with the link in my description or the QR code. Download the game for free, it's truly epic. Thanks Raid for supporting my channel, and now on to the rest of the video. So here's one I saw on the old Death Star archived website that I found amazing. Look at Trevelyan's left-right handedness throughout the game. On facility, he's right-handed, holding the stock in his right hand and the trigger in his left. The same goes for him on caverns and on cradle, so he holds his weapons right-handedly. Even on train, where he holds the ZMG one-handed, he's holding it in his right hand. Fair enough. However, on control, if we can sneak into the elevator at the end, we notice he's actually holding his weapon left-handedly. This clearly has to be a small mistake, 
And it's not a huge one by any means, unless they wanted a hidden easter egg of him being ambidextrous, although I doubt that. It's just something that's pretty cool to see, especially since it's something so rarely thought about. I'm amazed that Death Star noticed this all these years ago, as it's probably just mostly been forgotten about ever since. So here's an interesting quirk that you've probably never noticed. Well, because it has to do with a couple things that usually aren't in the game. You see, when you go to pick up an item, you usually get to see the external model in the game. You know, here's the external model for the sniper on dam, and here it is when you're using it yourself. Same goes for the KF-7, and pretty much every other weapon in the game. That includes pretty rare stuff, like the automatic shotgun, which you can find on statue or caverns, the throwing knives on Bunker 2, or the Moonraker laser on Aztec. We even see the Golden Guns external model on Egypt when we go to pick it up. However, there are a handful of weapons you get with cheats, the old guns cheat in particular, which do not appear in the game in this way. In particular, the hunting knife and the plain shotgun, just called the shotgun. There is a way, however, to see their external models in the closing cutscene for some levels. Bond will use or put away whatever weapon he was last holding when he finished the mission. So for example, on Frigate, we can see him put away both the hunting knife and the plain shotgun. This is kind of cool. He puts away the hunting knife and throwing knife the proper way, the same direction he holds them in-game, whether he's holding the tip or the handle. Interestingly, the gold and silver PP7s appear in the cutscene as the plain PP7, so perhaps these external models just aren't in the game at all. The plain PP7 is also the default item shown when you enter with nothing or a random gadget, and sadly the taser also shows up as the plain PP7. I just think the plain shotgun cutscene is so obscure that it's just really cool and fascinating to me. This depot ending is kind of funny because it'll use the plain PP7 default for the rocket launcher or grenade launcher. I guess they specifically programmed that in to prevent the ending from being too silly. But it is pretty funny using the shotgun here, which just seems to blast the guards away. Or the sniper, which looks pretty silly anyways. Okay, speaking of weapon anomalies, here's an interesting discussion that comes up every now and then. Which levels have no grenades? Believe it or not, it's only two levels, Dam and Train. Dam makes sense, I guess, because it's the first level and they didn't want to be too difficult. Train makes sense too, because you wouldn't want to be tossing nades around while traveling on a moving train. That being said, there are a couple levels with nades that don't make sense with this convention. For example, Frigate. Why would they let guards chuck nades around a boat in the middle of the ocean? This seems like a terrible idea. Another perhaps even worse idea are the nades on Silo. You know, a missile launch silo. So given that safety didn't exactly seem to play a reason on allowing guards to pull nades or not, it's kind of a mystery as to why there are no nades on train. But I guess as they say, it is what it is. Interestingly, the rarest level for nades is probably Bunker 2, since only the spawning alarm guards can pull nades, and they do so very rarely, even so. They only spawn if the camera catches you for too long, sounding the alarm, and even then, these nade pulls are pretty rare. Plus, the level becomes almost unplayably laggy when the alarm sounds, so it's definitely a good thing that we don't need a nade for an optimal strategy on Bunker 2 though we can't help but wonder how a nade might help things in a speedrun if it were possible to get one on dam or train. The Plastique is perhaps the most unusual gadget or item in all of GoldenEye 007. It only appears on Silo, but its mystique and lore goes quite deep. For one, it can be quite buggy. If you throw a plastique on a collectible object, such as ammo or a circuit board, and then pick it up, thus picking back up the plastique, and then throw a grenade immediately, the game will often just crash. Take a look. Not only that, but the plastique is unique in its role as a gadget, in that it will show up as your weapon of choice on the end screen. You see, if I play Dam and immediately select the Covert Modem, then run around for a few minutes and end the mission, clearly having held out the Covert Modem more than anything else, 
it'll still just say that my weapon of choice was whatever thing I held out most aside from the covered modem. And this is typical for most gadgets. However, if I hold out the plastique more than other items, it will indeed come up as the weapon of choice. I mean, this kind of makes sense since it does, you know, blow up and whatnot. But it's not really a weapon, as if the plastic goes off, you just pass away with 100% certainty, there's no way to survive a plastic explosion, aside from invincibility of course, it just explodes on and on forever. So yeah, the plastique is a strange and unusual item in the game and will remain mysterious until we can get our hands on a full decomp of GoldenEye 007. One facet of the game that's intrigued me recently are rare lines of dialogue that you almost never see when playing the game either conventionally nor speedrunning. For example, everyone who plays Facility will encounter the line, glad you could make it 007 when you first encounter Trevelyan, and most might remember that a subsequent line has some variation depending on how much health you have remaining. However, did you know that if you leave Trevelyan after initiating some lines of text, you'll get this rare line of text. There's a job to do here. Don't neglect your duty, James. And yet perhaps even rarer is the next step when you return to Trevelyan and get this one. So you came back. Similarly, on Statue, if you speak with Mishkin and then run away in the middle of your conversation, you'll get this prompt. Come back, Mr. Bond. There's no other way out. There's also another interesting one on Statue, which you get before picking up the Flight Recorder should you run too far away while trying to find it. The Flight Recorder could not possibly have been thrown this far from the explosion. Which I guess makes sense as a little hint, since the devs didn't want you running around the entirety of the already labyrinthian statue level if you couldn't find the Flight Recorder. There's also this funny one on Bunker 1 if you destroy the mainframe and then lead Boris to it. There's no way I can fix this. So yeah, those are some obscure and uncommon lines of text and prompts in GoldenEye. If you know of one of these or have a favorite obscure line of text, I would love to see you share in the comments. Okay, so here's one about the minutiae and details of the game that I just find super intriguing. It's about the names of the stages. I find this super fascinating though, so bear with me. Basically, if you pause and look at the objectives on a stage, the name of the level is not always the same as it is in the level select menu. For example, Dam is Bielomorje Dam. You know, fair enough, a more detailed name of the dam. Okay. Facility is Arkhangelsk. This is the location, the city in which these stages are located. Fair enough, I guess it kind of makes sense. But then Runway is just Runway. You know, given these three are all in the same location, it's kind of interesting that Facility comes up as Arkhangelsk, it seems that'd be more appropriate for Dam. And why is Runway just Runway? Surface 1 and Bunker 1 both come up as Severnaya, which is its exact location, okay, fair enough. Although given this convention, you'd think maybe there'd be a cuter name for the Bunker, but anyways. Silo comes up as Kyrgyzstan, which again is its exact location, but now we've moved away from a town or a region to an entire country or former Soviet Socialist Republic. Frigate is just Frigate, which is strange because in the intro cutscene it's referenced as Lafayette, so why they didn't give it its sort of special name here is very bizarre to me. Surface 2 and Bunker 2 are against Severnaya, okay, we'll accept that. Statue is just Statue Park, which is fair enough, you know, that's what it is, that's its proper name. But again, it could be St. Petersburg, we'll see about that. Archives are just archives. Again, this is odd because in the intro cutscene it shows military archives, and given these often have more detail, you wonder why it's not military archives here. Streets does come up as St. Petersburg, so fair enough, that makes sense. Depot comes up as Military Depot. You know, fair enough, but then why, again, is Archives not Military Archives? That is just so strange. Train comes up as Train. You'd think it might come up as Armored Train or something like that, but no, it's just Train. 
Jungle is Cuban jungle. Okay, a little bit of a clarification there. Control is Yanis Control, which I don't really entirely see where that comes. I guess it's Yanis's Control Center, but Control Center would make more sense. Caverns is Water Caverns. I think that one's pretty cool. An interesting tidbit on the Japanese version is that it's called the Pump Facility, which I remember some in a less mature frame of mind would find hilarious, you know, the Pump Facility. Cradle is Antenna Cradle, okay. Aztec is Aztec, fair enough. But this whole exercise was mostly about Egypt, which believe it or not, comes up as Crypt. This one is just so strange and bizarre. You know, in the menu select, you get El Sagira Temple, not Crypt. Why it's called Crypt in the watch menu, I have no idea, but it is. So if you want to throw everyone off and be a little bit of a silly poster, next time you get a personal record on Egypt, call it instead Crypt. So here's this super cool thing on Dam that's an extension of my previous exploration video. At the end of Dam, if you turn on a Game Shark code to prevent the level from fading out, you can explore the bottom of the dam. That's pretty cool, but there's even more than I originally had found. Fellow GoldenEye gamer Akadi dug up an old Game Shark code that removes some of the platform textures and reveals what's hidden beneath. This little vent. It seems to be only partially made and looks kind of weird, but it's pretty awesome. I just think it's so cool, such a random thing that so few people would ever have seen. I personally think this is almost certainly a relic of the early days of making the game, when the devs were just building levels before really knowing what to do with them. Perhaps an indication that there was at one point a plan, or at least a thought that dam and facility would be more directly connected to one another. I mean, it's pretty apparent that this vent is that connection, so it's cool to wonder exactly how this would have all played out. Maybe you would have gone directly into the facility without loading between levels or something. This poster on Shooters Forever back in 2006, where Akadi found the GameShark code, purports a theory that the damn vent is actually a beta leftover where you would retrieve the remote mines to destroy the truck. I've never heard that before, but it certainly could be true. I also found two more great Game Shark codes for Dam. One turns the aforementioned truck into a Jeep, which is just remarkable and epic to look at. And another one unlocks this door placed behind you at the very start of the mission. There's not much behind it once you get it open, just some empty space and some wall textures. The white whale diving into the ocean texture is very apparent. But there's no floor, and you can't go through here or explore any further. I mean, maybe you could with even more Game Shark codes, but that, my friends, will be for another time. The truck Jeep swap does make me wonder, though. The Jeep is smaller, less to render, so I wonder if it's less laggy, and thus would make the world records like Dam 52 just slightly easier with this code on. So, here's a thought experiment. What if you could complete a GoldenEye level in zero seconds? Zero, 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 zero on the timer. Our lowest world record currently is 15 seconds on Archive's Agent, but what if we could get not just zero, zero, two, or zero, zero, one, but zero, zero, zero? This has always been imagined as some kind of far-off, distant future endgame as it pertains to all of speedrunning, but Goldeneye in particular. The in-game time makes it easy to imagine that if you could somehow beat a level in 29 frames or fewer, it would show 0, 0, 0 on the end screen. However, we actually do know what happens if you're able to get a zero time on a stage. Take a look. If you turn on a GameShark code for all objectives complete and play Egypt, well, we get this very curious outcome. The level only wants to check to see if you've obtained the Golden Gun and passed away the Baron Samdi three times. 
There's no designated end zone or unloading area to the stage. The level just fades out wherever you are once you've completed the second of these two objectives. And so, with all objectives complete turned on, the level immediately completes and starts showing the cutscene you normally get for beating the stage. It's quite uncanny in that the level is bright and in daytime rather than in the dark, which is the normal status quo once you've passed away the second of the three barons. So seeing the cutscene in full daylight is just so truly strange. Congratulations, you've now beaten the stage in zero seconds, and we see this has a very strange effect on the end screen. The time shows up as 0000, zero, zero, zero just as you'd expect, but the best time will always show up as 119, no matter what, and it even overwrites your previous best time on the stage too. The reason for this has something to do with binary code. It's a bit beyond my pay grade, but I'll link the posts explaining it in the description. Not only that, but if you go back and turn off the old objectives complete code, and then beat the stage in less than 119, it'll save your new best time over top of that. Then if you go back and turn back on the old objectives complete code, you guessed it, time 000, and best time of 119 overwritten again. You could do this as many times as you wish, I suppose, though no one has ever really done this thousands of times and reported the results, so who knows. Anyhow, there goes one of the strangest obscurities in GoldenEye 007 and answers an age-old question we've had for decades. The zero-second speedrun actually becomes a one-minute, 19-second speedrun. So, there was a look at some of the most obscure, strange, and frankly useless GoldenEye knowledge and minutia. Let me know how many of these you did or didn't know about, because I always enjoy learning about these myself and digging up these strange obscurities and anomalies. Particularly, I've come to enjoy exploring these old GameShark codes now that I have an EverDrive and can easily do so. So let me know about any weird GameShark codes you'd like to see me try out. I've been meaning to get to the Destroy Everything code, but just haven't quite got around to it yet, hopefully in a future video. So if that's something you'd like to see, or any videos exploring the N64 era of video gaming and the gamers who have achieved amazing things on this stage, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you never miss a new video. I truly hope you all have a happy new year, all the best for 2023, wishing every single one of you health and happiness. All right, with all that, thanks for watching my friends, stay true, and I'll see you in the next stream or video.